Today I'm going to discuss energy and related to some of the stuff we've talked about already in this class like um, forces and accelerations. Uh, so energy is just a different way to think about and approach physics compared to say Newton's second law which we've been doing. So energy is a scalar quantity. So, so unlike acceleration or force or velocity where you have a magnitude and a direction, with energy you just have a magnitude. So you don't have to worry about directions or anything like that. So there's generally two types of energy that we're going to look at in mechanics. We have kinetic energy which for this class we're going to represent with a capital T. And kinetic energy is equal to one half mass times velocity squared. So it has units of mass, which is kilograms, velocity meter per second, and then square both of those. Kilogram meter squared sec per second squared. And now the other type of energy that we'll talk about in mechanics is potential energy. which we'll represent with a capital U. And so there's many different forms of potential energy. You can have gravitational potential energy. You can have spring potential energy. You can have chemical potential energy how batteries work, for example, and have electric potential energy, or magnetic potential energy, etc. And so for this class, things like gravitational and spring potential energy are what we're going to be most interested in. And for classical mechanics, these two are an example of, um, so these are obviously related to gravitational force and spring force. And those two forces are called conservative forces. And they're called conservative forces because they conserve energy. So other than say doing an experiment and seeing that energy is conserved when you uh, have a spring, something bouncing on a spring, how do we know that these forces are conservative? And we will touch on that later in the class when we talk about Lagrangians and we'll show how to derive which quantities are conserved and it'll turn out that these energies are going to be conserved quantities. So what does potential energy look like? So for conservative forces, so those that conserve energy, Uh, for example, gravity springs. We can derive the potential energy from the force itself. So our equation 
It's like this. Negative gradient of potential energy. So we need to remember from calculus that this gradient is equal to the derivative with respect to x i hat plus the derivative with respect to y j hat plus the derivative with respect to z k hat. And so then you, if you're doing the gradient of potential energy, gradient of u would equal partial derivative with respect to x u i hat plus partial with respect to y k hat plus partial u with respect to z k hat. And so instead of writing this whole mess every time, we just condense it into this nice, easier to write gradient of u notation. Okay, so now what does this look like? Well, let's do gravity as an example. So for gravitational force, let's derive the potential energy U from the gravitational force, which was equal to mg. Okay. So we could draw a little mass just to keep our, our mind straight. So we have force of gravity pointing down. So we could rewrite this vector as m negative mg in the y direction, which is j hat. Okay. So if we write our equation, this is going to be u sub g because this is the gravitational potential energy. And if we broke this apart into components, We know that this left hand side of the equation is equal to negative mg in the j hat direction. Now, if we compare both sides, we know that on the left side, there's only a j hat component, there's only a force in the y direction. So our potential energy can't have any x, can't have any changes in the x or z direction, because if, if it did, then there would be a force component in those directions. So we know that these two terms are not going to matter. And so now we have negative mg and if I go back, I have forgotten my minus sign out in front. So we had mg in the j hat direction equals partial derivative of potential energy in the y direction. 
So we've got a negative sign on both sides, so those will go away, they'll cancel. And now if we want to solve for potential energy, we can move the dy to the other side. And then solving for the potential energy, we would take the integral of both sides. And I'll do a definite integral from zero to y. So now the integral of, so mass is a constant, g is constant near the surface of the earth. So the integral of dy is just y going from zero to y. Which is, oh, maybe I'll do, maybe I'll call it h instead of y. So mgy going from zero to h equals the potential energy due to gravity. And so potential energy due to gravity is mgh when we plug in our bounds from h to zero. So now we've defined kinetic energy, which we're representing with this, vector, uh, this variable capital T. And we know that equals one half m v squared. And then we have potential energy which we are representing with a capital U. And for gravity, that was equal to MGH. So now what can we do with these, these things? Uh, so that's, that gets into a concept called conservation of energy. And like I said previously, later on in the course, we'll see why energy is conserved. Um, so be on the lookout for that. But for right now, we'll just accept that energy is conserved. And what this means is that whatever energy you start with has to equal the same amount of energy that you end with. And so let's see what I mean by that. So no matter what situation you can think of, let's say a ball falling from a height h and hitting the ground. So energy initial equals energy final. So what energy are we starting from? So let's say that the ball is initially at rest. So if it's at rest, there's no kinetic energy. So it's a height h above the ground, so it has gravitational potential energy. And let's just be pedantic, let's say T initial for the initial kinetic energy and then potential grab final kinetic final. So like I said, the initial velocity was zero, so that's gonna be zero. As it's hitting the ground, the height will be zero. So the final potential energy due to gravity is zero. Now we get MGH equals one half MV final squared. So if we wanted to know what our impact velocity is, V final. 
So we see that the masses cancel out. And solving for B final, B final squared equals 2GH. And then taking the square root of that, of both sides, you get square root 2GH. So now let's see if that agrees with what we've done previously in this class. So previously, if we wanted to solve a problem like this, we would use the kinematic equations. So let's write those down. So we have, and this is moving in the y direction, so I'll just write everything with y. Delta y equals b initial t plus one half a t squared. b final equals b initial plus a t. And b final squared equals b initial squared plus two a delta y. Okay. So with this problem, we're given a height, so we know delta y. We don't know a time. We know the initial velocity and we want to find the final velocity, so I'm going to pick this kinematic equation. The final squared equals the initial squared plus 2a delta y. The initial velocity was zero. B final squared equals 2a, and then delta y. Solving for B final, we get square root 2a delta y. Plug in our acceleration for g and our height h, and you see that these two things agree. So the work that we were doing in the beginning of the class is consistent with this new work that we're doing for the conservation of energy. So it's important to check that kind of thing to make sure your different methods and theories are consistent with each other. Uh, but there's different situations where one might be easier to do than the other. For example, you'll notice that in on the energy side of things there's no time variable at all so if i wanted to know how long it took the ball to fall down doing conservation of energy doesn't directly help me find that time whereas doing things with kinematics i could easily solve for the time and vice versa there are times when doing conservation of energy is easier to think about, especially if you have more than one force. Uh, so for example, if you have more than one force acting on an object, then you would need to use Newton's second law to figure out what its acceleration is. And then you can plug that acceleration into the kinematic equations or um, if you're doing conservation of energy, as you'll see when we do more complicated problems, the forces can be baked into the different energy components and it can be easier to solve problems in that way. And so one note or caveat that I wanted to make is that when we when I say that energy is conserved, uh, let's see. So we're talking about conservation of energy. I will make the claim that this statement is true no matter what. So energy has to be conserved. This is one of the laws of the universe. Now we can manipulate 
our system or our definitions of energy to say that energy is or is not conserved. And so what I mean by that is, let's say I have, uh, maybe this is a good example. Maybe we have a rocket ship or a firework or something and it's propelling itself. If I say that the system is just the rocket ship and not whatever is coming out of the back of it, now, if inside the dotted line is my system, then my system is losing energy. But it's, it's losing that energy to the outside or to the environment. So the statement where I can say that energy is always conserved is in a closed system. In a closed system, energy is always conserved. So for example, if you define your system as the universe, then universally energy has to be conserved. If however you define your system to be some smaller region, then you can have a system where the energy is not conserved, but that energy is just being put into the environment or the surroundings of that system. And so another misconception that people have is that uh, non-conservative forces are making energy not be conserved. And that is not entirely true. It's not true at all, but the misconception arises from the fact that mechanical energy is not conserved. Uh, so mechanical energy is defined as in classical mechanics is just the, uh, I'll just say ME, is just the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So for, if you have non-conservative forces, such as friction, air resistance, drag, etc. Then your mechanical energy is not conserved. But really all we need to do to treat these systems is to remember that energy always has to be conserved. And so if we're writing down our different energies, let's say we have some initial kinetic energy, some initial potential energy, and we end up with some final kinetic energy and some final potential energy. And if these values don't match, then we have a problem because energy is not conserved. 
So we need to add in some term uh, like the work done by non-conservative forces, work in it. So for example, if I, let's say I pushed or I slid some block across a table and I saw that eventually the block stopped, I would say, hey, wait a second, my mechanical energy was not conserved, but my total energy had to be conserved. So whatever energy was lost, let's say initially you started with two joules of energy. And at the end, you only had one joule of energy, or in this case, zero. Then this work done by non-conservative forces, you would know is equal to two joules. And so I gave friction as an example of a non-conservative force. Um, but what kind of energy would friction release? So there's a couple of different things you could think of. Uh, so if you think about, say, for example, a car's brakes. If you slam on your brakes really hard, you know that you hear loud noises. So there's sound energy that's being released. And you're not going to recover that sound and turn it back into kinetic energy or something. And Another type of energy that's released with friction is heat energy. And so the energy of the system has to be conserved. It just might not be conserved in your mechanical energies, meaning your kinetic energy and your potential energies, but it has to be conserved. So in this case, you are releasing your energy in the form of sound and heat, but the energy is still conserved. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Peep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.